Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Can you believe it's been a year since Charles and I came? It's, it's unreal. And um, I'd just like to say for myself, thank you so much um, for opening um, your hearts to us. Charles had been here before. I hadn't. And, um, you know, you never know what, what the unknown is, right? But we had a blessed time here. And um, I'll stop talking about it because I'll get upset. But... <laughs> Let's start with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this Sabbath day. I thank you for the service already, the beautiful music, the ability to express ourselves, our, our praises, our concerns to you. You are a God who loves us, and you're listening to us, and you want to hear what's on our hearts and on our minds. And beyond that, Lord, you want to share with us what's on your heart and what's on your mind. And I pray, Lord, that as I endeavor to give a message that you will speak through me and that we will hear what you are saying to us, each individually. It's amazing how you can communicate to all of us at the same time. It can be something different. But I pray, Lord, that you'll speak to our hearts this morning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I remember a few years ago... Um, I went to a funeral. It was a distant relative who I didn't particularly know well, but we went to the funeral. Um, and this man was not religious per se. And so the family had arranged for a minister to conduct the funeral. Um, I'm not sure where he came from. He was an ordained minister, but he didn't appear to be affiliated with any church. Um, now the man who had passed away, he was known for water skiing. In fact, he had built a lake by his house. I'm not sure how, but he had built this lake um, by his house, and his house was right by it. And at one point, he was some sort of champion water skier. And then he started a school for water skiing there. And so that was kind of his thing. Um, now, at his funeral, the minister went on and on about how this man had fulfilled his calling 
how God had called him to build the lake, and so he had built the lake. And I remember thinking about it, was that really God's calling for his life to build a lake to water ski? It seemed odd to me, but I, I just remember that in my mind. It, it, was that really God's calling for this man? Now, have you ever wondered about what your calling might be or what your purpose is? I think we've all been there on some level, maybe alone at night thinking, you know, what's my purpose anyways? Why am I here? Are people going to remember me afterwards? Um, what's the meaning to life? And sometimes if we don't have a purpose or we don't feel a meaning to our lives, it can lead bad directions, can lead to depression, can lead to different things. But I think on some level, we've had thoughts of, you know, what's my purpose? Now, the way some people talk about finding your calling, it makes it sound very complicated and hard, that we need to be searching, we need to look under the rocks and around the corners, and maybe one day it'll bump us in the face, oh, that's my calling. Is it supposed to be that difficult? Is it supposed to be that difficult? Now, I've struggled with this before. I remember going to college, I had absolutely no idea what to take, and I changed my majors a few times, and thought that I was inadequate and stressed out about how I didn't have any skills, um, but somehow I made it through. So we've all been there on some level. But what about our calling as Christians? Is that supposed to be complicated and mysterious to us? Does God have a calling for us? Now in the Bible, we see some examples of very dramatic callings and where it seems like that Bible character should have no doubt of what God wants them to do. I think one of the most dramatic callings was to the prophet Isaiah. Turn to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. Isaiah chapter 6, in your Old Testament. Isaiah 6, we'll start with verse 1. Isaiah 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it, stu above it stood seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Now that's a dramatic calling, is it not? Isaiah saw the Lord, saw a vision of heaven, and heard the voice of God saying, Come, come with me. And he said, I will go. So he had a very dramatic calling. Now, don't you ever wish sometimes God was so clear with us? Um, beyond Isaiah, Moses got a burning bush, and the Red Sea parted in front of him. Elijah got fire from heaven. John the Baptist saw the Holy Spirit descend like a dove on Jesus and heard the voice of God. Sometimes they think, oh, God, can't you do that for me? But at the same time, when we read the Bible, even though many of these characters did get divine revelations, and I think there's a reason why we may not today, but that's a whole other topic, it didn't always make their journeys with God simpler. Moses struggled leading the children of Israel. Elijah got so depressed he wanted to die. John the Baptist doubted if Jesus was the Messiah after he saw what he saw. Think of Abraham. God called him as well, but Abraham had no idea how God would fulfill his promises to him and ended up taking measures into his own hands. And so even having a divine re revelation, it's not always clear. It's not always clear, it seems. 
Now, does my calling depend on something I do? Is my purpose something I make for myself? Or is it made for me? Let's look at the beginning. Did God have a purpose for Adam and Eve? Turn to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 28. Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So did God have a purpose for Adam and Eve? Yes, he did. He had a purpose for them before he created them. He said, we're going to make man, and this is what my purpose is for man. And so God had a purpose for Adam and Eve from day one. He created them to have dominion over the earth. So Adam and Eve did not create their own purpose. They didn't have to prove themselves to the Lord. He gave them their purpose. They were made in the image of God. And also we see in Genesis that they were to tend their garden home, and of course they were to worship the Lord. So they had a purpose. Now, unfortunately, since sin, we no longer have dominion over this earth. But does that mean that God no longer has a purpose for us? He has a purpose for us. 2 Timothy 1.9 says that we are called with a holy calling. A holy calling. So not only do we have a calling, we have a holy calling. And if something is holy, it is set apart from the rest. For instance, the Sabbath is made holy. It's set apart. From the rest of the week. God has a purpose for us that is set apart from the rest of humanity. So as long as we're Christians following Christ, we should expect him to give us our calling. Now we're going to look at a few verses which show us what our calling is. And this isn't rocket science by any means, but unfortunately I don't think many of us are living up to God's true calling for our lives. So let's turn to Matthew 28. 19 and 20, we can see an aspect of our calling in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. What does God want from us? What is his purpose for us? <clears throat> Matthew 28, verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Is that a calling for our lives? Absolutely. Part of our calling is to be witnesses for the Lord, to go out and teach others what God has done for us and what his word reveals, to make disciples, to lead them to a commitment to the Lord, and teaching them to observe the truths of the Bible. That is certainly part of our calling. Regardless of what our occupation may be, this is our greater calling. So I want to ask you, how are you doing with your calling? How are you doing with that part of your calling? Now still in Matthew, turn back to chapter 6. Matthew 6.33. This may be a familiar verse to many of us. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 33. Matthew 6.33, the Bible says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Now if you look back, um, starting in verse 25 and onward, Jesus is saying, don't worry about your life, essentially. He's saying, don't worry about what you'll eat or drink. Don't worry about your clothing. Don't I take, doesn't my father take care of the birds and the flowers and all of nature? He says, don't worry about that. And then he says that verse, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things, all the necessities of life will be given to you. Now, unfortunately, I think we tend to get this backwards. 
we seek first the necessities of life, and then we'll give God something. Does that make sense? Oh, Lord, I will, I will uh, give to the church after I, I go buy my groceries or whatever. And it sounds reasonable to our human minds. But Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God, and I will take care of the rest. Oftentimes, we put our needs before God's work or his will. We seek what, first what we perceive as our needs, and then we'll seek God and his kingdom if we have time in our busy schedules. Jesus says, seek him first, put his will first, put his kingdom first, and I will take care of the rest. That takes faith. That takes trust. But that is our calling. How are you doing with your calling? Now let's turn to Colossians. Colossians, in the New Testament, Colossians 3, verse 12. To your right, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians before Thessalonians. Colossians 3, 12 to 17. Colossians 3, starting in verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. What beautiful verses. This could be a sermon of itself. But I think that last verse summarizes the thought. Whatever you're doing, whatever you're saying, however you're interacting with one another, can Christ be part of it? He says he needs to be. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. A spirit of forgiveness, a spirit of humility, meekness, should characterize how we act and what we say and do with those around us. Now the heading of that section in my Bible is character of the new man. Can we do any of this on our own? Can we be humble on our own? Can we be forgiving on our own? Absolutely not. But this is where Christ is in our hearts. So our calling is about centering our lives around bringing glory to God, pleasing him. How often do we sit and think, Lord, how can I please you today? I wish I did more, um, but that needs to be our attitude. This is our calling. Now this all leads to 2 Thessalonians 1, just two books over to your right. What is God really getting at here? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verses 10 to 12. 2 Thessalonians 1, 10 to 12. 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 10. When he comes, speaking of Jesus, when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe, because our testimony among you was believed, Therefore, we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our calling is that Christ be glorified in us. And that is a high calling indeed. Our calling is to lead lives to the glory of God. Our purpose is to witness for the Lord. Our mission is to seek first the kingdom of heaven, a high calling. In whatever situation, whatever phase of life, regardless of time and place, we are called to live for the Lord. Now, if we're living for the Lord, who are we not living for? Ourselves. Ourselves. Certainly not the devil, but 
uh, beyond that ourselves. We're not to be living for ourselves. We're living for Jesus. Jesus says in Matthew 16, 24, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So it's not about us. It's not about us. Now, does this mean the life of a Christian is drudgery? No, absolutely not. But what it does mean is that we are living for a higher purpose. We are not to live for our simple, selfish desires. We are living for Christ's desires. Now, none of this is a new thought. But what does this mean, practically speaking? Practically speaking, the nitty-gritty on living every day, how does this mean for our everyday lives? Now, how many of you have a job? Many of us have a job. Your calling and your purpose in your job is to bring glory to God through your words and deeds. How you handle your coworkers, your clients, your patients, whatever it may be that you're working, your surroundings are. Your purpose is not just to check off your list and to get a paycheck. You are seeking to intentionally share God's love with people. Let's think about this. Does God want you to talk to others about him? Yes or no? Yes, yes he does. Um, does he want you to warn people the times we live and for them to be ready for Jesus to come? Yes or no? Yes, absolutely. Does he want you to share the truths of the Bible with others? Yes, he does. So who does he want to use? Us, absolutely. Um, he needs to use those who know better. And by God's grace, he's given us knowledge in the Bible to share with others. We need to spend more time at work. Um, I'm sorry. We spend more time at work than we normally do at home through the week. We spend a lot of time there. I'm sure there's statistics somewhere about how many years of our lives we spend at work. Um, but we spend a lot of time there. And there's a reason. God puts us there for a reason. Get to know your coworkers. Be transparently Christian. And pray for God to set up divine appointments for you. Be willing, and God will bless. I guarantee it. And before you know it, you may be bringing a coworker to the Lord through the Bible. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't that be awesome? But we need to be thinking in that way. We need to be looking for those opportunities because God wants to use us. Now, how many of you are married or have a significant other? Many of us, right? Your calling, and this is a hard one, <laughs> your calling is to bring glory to God in how you relate to your spouse. I've heard it said that how you treat your spouse says more about your relationship with the Lord than about your relationship with your spouse. That can be a tough pill to swallow at times. Um, but how you treat your spouse says more about your relationship with the Lord than it says about your relationship with your spouse. What about friendships? We all have friends. Your calling is to bring glory to God in the way you interact with those who are your friends. Have intentional friendships. Be looking to see how you can be a blessing for your friends that may have a spiritual interest. We rarely have intentional friendships. But how sad would it be to get to heaven and look around and find that one of your friends is not there that you had known for dozens of years. And maybe you had never shared the gospel with them. Maybe you had never asked. How sad would that have been? God doesn't, wanna have a, doesn't want us to have those regrets. He wants us to step out in faith and take the opportunities around us. Now, many, of, many have children. And by God's grace, when Charles and I have our child, my calling will be to bring glory to God in how I raise and how I parent my child. That child will not be mine. It's the Lord's first, and that's a responsibility. So our, our children, our spouses, our jobs, schoolmates, the people that are surround us are not arbitrary people. They're children of God. And because I love the Lord, I need to treat and act them accordingly. Whether they know it or not, they are children of God, and we have a responsibility to fulfill our calling. I've come, to the con I'm sorry, I've come to the conclusion that life is not so much about our work, it's not about our hobbies or even our families, it's about our relationship with the Lord and how we treat him through the people and places in our lives. Jesus says, whatsoever ye do to the least of these, my brethren, ye have done to me. And this certainly includes those who are down and out as we often apply the verse, but even more so it, it it includes those who are important to us, our families, our friends, our co-workers. How I treat Charles when I'm 
is how I treat the Lord. How I treat someone who may hit my car is how I'm treating the Lord. How I treat the bank teller, who in my opinion may be very incompetent, is how I'm treating the Lord. How I respond to my mother disappointing me is how I respond to the Lord. We need to get into our minds that God has called us to a way of life, a life of generosity and heart transformation. In my selfish, carnal nature, I want to snap at the bank teller. I want to give Charles the silent treatment when I'm upset, and I want to eat a pint of ice cream when I'm feeling hurt. But is that how God responds to us? Thank the Lord that's not how Jesus responds to us. Our calling is to give glory to God, and it's all about transformation. Turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God wants to transform our minds, our characters, and only God can do that. God wants to work in us to do his pleasure. But how does he do that? Well, when I want to nag Charles, he gives me the power to restrain my tongue. When I'm waiting at the bank, he can give me compassion in my heart to the worker who's undoubtedly having a stressful day. And when someone wrongs me, he can give me the spirit of forgiveness. He wants to give us the mind of Christ. Christ in us, glorified. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 2. To your right, Philippians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians 2, starting in verse 5. Philippians 2, starting in verse 5 and onward. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the appearance of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Verse 12, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God, without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Do we live in a crooked and perverse generation? Absolutely. God's design, his calling for us is that we shine as lights in the world. Isn't that amazing? That is his calling for us. Now, when Jesus called his disciples, did he call them part-time or full-time? Full-time. It was full-time. Remember, Peter and Andrew, James and John, they left their nets, in other words, their normal way of life, to follow Jesus. Now, obviously, not all of us are, are paid to witness, if you will. But think about Paul. He worked. He was a tent maker. Um, but I guarantee you, that when he was in a city working on tents, he was using that ability to reach out to his fellow tradesmen and make contacts. Guarantee you. Again, our jobs are to be tools to reach those in that particular environment. You in your place of employment, you in your school, you in your family circle can reach out to people who may never be reached in any other way. Not everyone will respond to someone like Charles or myself coming and knocking on your door. It's just not going to happen. But you are there for a purpose, and you can reach those around you in a way that a paid minister cannot do. You have a calling. 
I fear that many of us compartmentalize our Christian experience. There is God's time, and then there's our time. And perhaps from 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, is our time to make money. Sabbath is, is God's time. Maybe Wednesday night, if we're feeling like it, for prayer meeting. But is that really living for God? Scheduling God into our, our schedules? Is that living for God, truly? No. God wants all of us. Witnessing and compassion are not acts we schedule in our, car- in our calendars. They are to be part of our character. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This is a quote from the book Testimonies to the Church. It says, let us remember that a Christ-like life is the most powerful argument that can be advanced in favor of Christianity, and that a cheap Christian character works more harm in the world than the character of a worldling. Sobering words. Now this is all much bigger than us. Much bigger than us. Turn back to, turn back to Ephesians chapter 3, just back from Philippians, just a few pages. Ephesians 3, 9 and 10. Ephesians 3, verses 9 and 10. Ephesians 3, verse 9. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God may be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Now, what is this mystery? What is he talking about here? Jump down to verse 14. Verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Notice in verse 10, God wants to make known to the universe principalities and powers the mystery of God through the church, through the church. God's design for the church is that it's to be the light of the world, a beacon of hope, a shining example of God's love. But there's no way the church can do that if the individuals are not. It's just not going to happen. The church is people. It's made up of us. And if we're individually not surrendered and glorifying God through our, our own spirits, our own bodies, the church as a whole can't fulfill this mission. God needs us. The church needs us. Finally, let's turn to our scripture verse, 1 Peter 2.9. 1 Peter 2.9, right after Hebrews and James. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. 1 Peter 2.9, it's a beautiful verse. But you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So whose praises are we to proclaim? God's, the one who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Perhaps if we don't have a burden to witness, to fulfill our calling, to give God glory in every area of our lives, perhaps if we don't have that burden, perhaps we don't recognize that God has called us out of darkness into marvelous light. Perhaps we're distracted by anything and everything because we do not realize what God has done for us. Or maybe there's darkness still in our lives. Perhaps we don't see the light that he gives us is truly something marvelous, and it is something marvelous. Perhaps we need to rediscover our first love. Perhaps we need to get on our knees and ask the Lord to reveal to us what he has truly done for us. Now, as I wind up here, I want to share a story. I forget who shared this with me. It it was a minister. I forget who specifically. But he was talking to me about he went to visit a church member. 
And this was an older lady who was a shut-in. In fact, I believe she was basically bedridden. And the pastor was visiting with her and encouraging her. Then he asked her, so what are you going to do for Jesus? The woman just looked at him. Pastor, look at me. I can't get out of bed most days. What can I possibly do for Jesus? Well, the pastor thought a minute. You can write, can't you? Well, yes, I guess I can. Good. I will get you some names and addresses of some people that you can write encouraging notes to, that you can share scriptures with them. Um, And the woman just brightened up. So the pastor began giving her names and addresses for church members in different contexts to write encouraging notes to. Then an evangelistic series came up at the church, and he gave her names and numbers of people to call to invite to the meetings. Soon she began a prayer list. Soon part of every day was filled with calling or writing or praying. She found that there was plenty that she could do for the Lord, and here was an essentially bedridden lady. Brothers and sisters, there is so much that we can do for the Lord so much. We have so many advantages and knowledge and skills and time. Jesus wants us. He wants us. Brothers and sisters, I think we need to refocus. Are we neglecting our true calling? Are we neglecting our true calling? Is living getting getting in the way of your first love and your first duty? Are you more concerned about your finances than you are with honoring God? Are you more concerned with achieving some pursuit, whether in in school or work? And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but does that take first place over trying to pursue someone to win them to the Lord? I ask you to think about your life right now. What is the focus? What is most important to you? What are your current goals? And what do they say about your spiritual life? What are you doing for the Lord? The Lord has a calling for us to bring glory to him in every area of our lives. It's time we take it seriously. Now, as we bow our heads for prayer, let's take a few moments of silence, and let's talk to the Lord. Let's ask him, what is it that we need to surrender to him? Are we fulfilling our calling? Maybe we are, and God wants to encourage us. But let's take a few moments, pray to the Lord, and ask him to speak to us. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word that's so clear to us what our purpose is. We should never doubt what our purpose is. Our purpose is to bring glory to you. You have called us out of darkness, the darkness of this world. There's nothing in this world for us, Lord. You have a greater life for us, and a greater kingdom is coming. But so often we lose focus. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us here that you'll keep us focused that you will take away the distractions. Maybe we need to give up some of those distractions if we recognize that they're taking time from you. But I pray, Lord, that you'll speak to us all individually, that we will know what it is that you want from us, Lord, and that we will take stock, if you will, of our lives, see where the focus is, and are we truly living for you? Have we truly given you our whole lives? Lord, as our heads are bowed right now, I want to ask if there's anyone who knows deep in his or her heart that she or he has not been living for the Lord, and they want to respond to you, or if there are areas that we recognize in our lives that we need to surrender, we need to truly give you all, I pray, Lord, that we will raise our hands if we know that there is an area in our life that we need to surrender to you that we'll just raise our hands right now as every eye is closed and every head is bowed. Lord, you know who has raised their hands. You know, Lord, those who need in a special way for your presence to be poured out in their lives, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you will help us to surrender, that you'll help us to truly stay focused. Give us clarity of thought that we can know what steps to take 
and we know that you will lead us. I praise you and I thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness that you always extend to us. We thank you, Father, for that. May we live for you anew this day in each day following. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Shall we stand? Heavenly Father, I pray, live out thy life within us. May we do your will. May we glorify you in everything we say and do. May our thoughts, may our actions be reflective of our high calling that you have placed upon us. Please go with us from this church and be with us till we meet together again. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Dismiss us, Lord, with blessing we pray, as from thy worship we go.